thank you so much, Sam, and a huge welcome to everyone. So excited to be here, just talking to people who are sitting outside, uh, standing outside. For many people, they said that this was their first in-person event for over two years. For many people, it's their first in-person event this year. And I asked a lot of people, what do you hope to learn today? And basically, everyone said the same thing. Everyone said, we've been trapped in our office, trapped in Zoom, trying to learn from each other in our office, trying to use the data that we have internally to understand what's going on with our customers. And today, the number one thing that everyone said they wanted to learn was just something from other people, something from other brands, other companies, companies, what's working for you, what can I bring back to my business? And if that's the only thing you take away from today, that is mission accomplished for us. As Sam mentioned, we exist to inform every intuition, dissolve any doubt by making it easy to uncover opportunity with consumer data. We call it continuous insights. We have marketers losing the ability to track customers and get data using cookies, new challenges as we'll see coming from inflation, lots of things are changing right now. But why we put on today was to bring together a whole bunch of different brands just to learn from each other, inspire each other, and that's the whole theme of today. So please take the opportunity to network with each other. We from Attest will be around, talk to the speakers. I'll be around later as well to geek out on coral reefs and data analytics if you want to. Those are two things of my jam. But right now, um, I wanted to A, say a huge thank you to Lucy, um, who organized this event. In particular, also Katie and Taya from our team who put on all the amazing branding that we see. A huge number of others from Attest. And I also wanted to encourage you to go try to win the thousand pounds at uh, our family fortune style thing. There's a automated AI-driven beer pouring robot that reads your mind to pour you a beer. We've got that. We've got ice cream rolls. We've got lots of fun things going on. But please try and learn from today and just take something back to your office, because that's why we exist. That's why we're here. So we wanted to put a bit of data behind what's happening with inflation right now. What does it mean for consumers? It's something we read about in the papers constantly right now. It's the number one topic on the news, cost of energy, cost of food rising. It's the number one concern, as we'll see, on people's minds. What's going on in the world of products, consumption, pricing? Everything's in motion right now. So we ran a bunch of research with 1,900 consumers in the UK, nationally representative across the UK in May. So this data is very fresh and real. And we just wanted to put some numbers behind it to bring it all to life. Consumers are getting squeezed. Um, we can see all over the place this is what's going on, but we wanted to put some numbers behind exactly where. So first of all, only 4% of people are feeling no effect at all. And spoiler alert, these are wealthy old people Wealthy old people, they're the not at all, the 4%. Everyone else is affected by this in some way. Something is going on right now which is changing. And then we got into exactly who is feeling it the most. And intuitively, younger people are feeling the pinch the most. This is where inflation is hurting the most. Gen Z, younger people, most affected, millennials quite close. Boomers, not really that affected on a relative basis. And those wealthy old people feeling very comfortable right now while the rest of us are suffering. The sentiment of a nation. So we have to do a little bit of a UK calibration here because I think if we ran this in Florida, happiness would probably be a nine out of 10 just because everything's awesome constantly. So let's use the middle column here as a calibration. Happiness is quite low right now, 6.3 out of 10. And you might say that's because we're cynical British people, but here's a calibration. To the right, optimism about the future is lower than happiness right now. People are feeling worse about the future than they are right now. Things are going to get worse. This is a very bad thing in the minds of consumers. And then we look at financial security, crystal ball on the right, crystal pound on the left. People are not feeling financially secure at all. Everything is changing, and people are wondering what's going on next. And where are people cutting back? And we'll get into more detail on this, but politicians love to talk about millennials and their avocado toast. Cancel your Netflix so that you can get your housing deposit together. People are cutting back on takeaways, but let's look at a few interesting pairs of data points. So people are reducing energy usage. Great news for the environment, great, use, great news for um, carbon emissions around us. People are also taking up competition to switch energy provider. We've seen that in a bunch of different data sets that we've produced. People are looking to change the energy provider to take up locking in different prices, locking in energy efficiency benefits, locking in ways to reduce the energy usage to reduce their total bill as much as possible while market forces are working against us. Pair this with people are cutting back or ditching premium brands, particularly for clothing. 
big problems out there for clothing manufacturers, particularly at the high end of the market. People are buying secondhand more. Again, a great environmental benefit. Less original things being produced, more secondhand buying. But then we pair it with the next data point. This effect we've seen on the last two slides is not driven by consumers trying to be more green. It's driven purely by price. People are caring less and less about the environment. We ran a similar data set a few months ago and a few quarters ago. People were prepared to pay a little bit more for green products. Now that's all changed back. These green moves we've seen in people cutting back on their energy bills and energy consumption, people buying more secondhand clothes, is driven by cost, not by environmental challenges. And here's an interesting set of data points we can pair together. There's a big consumer shift. It aids the environment, but those two are purely related to value and price. And that's something we're seeing across the board. And you saw earlier exactly which groups are the most affected. Next. What are people doing and where are they cutting back most? People are staying in more, going out less, and spending less on eating out. I saw a restaurant, it's a two Michelin star restaurant. They recently did a huge multi-million pound refurb and you have to pay 450 pounds per person to even make a booking. I think they're probably in this 82% down here. I don't want to name the restaurant. <laughs> they probably have some kind of mafia, they're gonna come and get us. But people are cutting back on things like that and even, <laughs> everything. These numbers were far larger than I imagined before we ran the research, and that's why we run research, to put some quantification behind it. But this is where people are cutting back. Also in these areas, so less on home improvement, less on travel. Gen Z are the most committed to holiday plans. Those are those um, 41 to 55-year-olds. Uh, and people are cutting back all over the place, but this, the absolute scale of these numbers are quite large. Everyone is affected in some way. People are cutting the cord on Netflix and other subscriptions. We've seen a lot of news about Netflix recently. Just this week, Klarna had a big cutback. We're seeing many different subscription economy uh, companies cutting back staff numbers because customers are seeing that as one of the first things to go out the door. We ran a whole bunch of um, research on direct-to-consumer over the summer and in Q3, and it was all about value for money. The fundamentals that drive direct-to-consumer and subscription businesses are about value for money, quality of products, and we can do jazzy things to win people back by lowering pricing or offering free products, but it seems to be a 50-50 shot as an ability to keep people. I saw a great offer last Friday. Freddy's Flowers started offering a free vase and a free bunch of flowers to anyone who canceled to come back for three months. Their CAC payback equation on that win back offer must be absolutely terrible for them. And if they're doing that in May, imagine what they'll be doing next month if this trend continues. Some really interesting things happening. And again, a fundamental reset in the subscription economy and what's going on right now. Brits keeping up appearances, people are spending less again. Uh, what's interesting here is we ran some research recently about hibags, highly invested in beauty and grooming, hibag people. And I always think about the kind of, many, many products have a normal distribution of consumption, where the value is. For beauty, there's a huge concentration at this very high spending end, and then like the ball gown of a queen, this huge long tail full of many, many hundreds and thousands of consumers, and all of that long tail is spending less. The hibags, the people who are very committed to spending on beauty and grooming, are spending a little bit less. It's the long tail full of everyone else that are spending, that are planning to cut back. Big consequences out there for beauty brands uh, and clothing brands in particular. Pimp my ride. People are thinking less about upgrading their car. Gen X, again, 51 to 55 year olds. For car manufacturers, here is another big moment. This reminds me of the story of Target, the company in the US. It's a bit like Asda and Argos combined. They had this famous moment in the past where they learned how to identify when people might be pregnant and might be starting a family before they'd even told their own relatives. They used data science for this. This is going back 20 years ago. Imagine what they can do now. Here is the similar moment for car companies. Those 51 to 50, so 41 to 45 year old people changing how they think about buying cars. Those are people with young families. Those are core heartland customers for car companies and manufacturers. Big shift in what's going on there, and we just wanted to put some numbers behind it. And what's interesting is we've seen food prices going up 5%, 10%, 15%, much more in some places. But very few people are actually planning to spend more on food, only 19%. 
almost half planning to spend less, 35% spending the same. So while food prices are going up, most people aren't changing, many people are reducing. And this is going countercultural to the food price inflation that we've been seeing. But again, we just wanted to quantify this and bring it to life because very few people are actually planning to spend more even though prices are rising. Think about that for a second. That is horrifying for many food producers, retailers. How long will this last are the questions that we start to ask ourselves next. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, one thing we won't cut back on, <laughs> TV companies would love it to be TV. Every TV company is out there saying you can't live without TV. Give yourself a little luxury. Netflix, don't cancel your subscription. Pet companies are out there saying your pets are your treasures. They're the thing that you should invest in most. They're the last thing out the door. Holidays, everyone should treat yourself. You're the last thing you should give up the holidays. Kids are very important. If you have kids, invest in your kids. They're the future. Fuel, you can't get to work without it in many places. Heating and food, we're back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But every single brand is fighting to be the one thing that customers won't cut back on. Every single one of these categories has a story, and it's food which is the thing that people won't cut back on, then heating, then fuel. Interesting to see kids at number four. Not sure what's going on there. Um, and pet companies always put themselves at the number one uh, point, particularly in the UK, around the thing that customers won't spend back on. Across all of our research, we just see that that fundamentally is not true. When really, really forced to make cuts and think about budgets, consumers cut back on other things first. And let's bring this to life a bit. We love a bit of verbatim to bring it to life. My children still uh, need to be fed. It's not their problem. That's why food is first. Holidays are important to make up for the crap years we had. That's why holidays are on the list at all, but they are fifth behind kids uh, on the result set. So this, again, is what doing great research brings to life. We can start to understand exactly what's going on right now, how people are feeling about it. And we thought these were some really fun, evocative quotes. Um, Investment appetite. People want to invest more, uh, but are actually investing less. People have less expendable income to save for the future, save for retirement, plan for anything else. And investments, lower appetite for risk means people are investing less across the board. How do bits Brits prefer to pay online? Interesting to see crypto and Bitcoin completely tank recently. The availability of payment by, by cryptocurrency was poor to begin with, but we Brits love to pay using cards, Apple Pay, PayPal, and when we think about exactly how we want to pay in stores, it's quite a different mix. So again, we're seeing a shift of what people are prioritizing their spending on, exactly how they want to spend that money and bring it to life. And then each individual level decision is shifting as we speak about exactly how consumers want to consume in this country right now. So to try and bring it all together, the, the key takeaways for brands, one, that drive to protect the family, the hierarchy of needs, tap into it. People are focused on spending on the things that they can't live without. We saw it was food, it was heating, holidays, pets, luxuries, TV, they're all distant right now. So as brands, no matter what your brand does and you can't change your product overnight, this is the number one thing to take away from this. Tap into the need to protect the family and the status quo and knowing that every single customer is feeling some effect of this, except for those 4% of wealthy old people, um, tap into that innate desire that exists right now because that's very different from what's happening even just a few weeks and months ago. Second, focus on meeting that evolving core need. Things will change between May and June. Things will change again between June and July. You need to know what's important to consumers and you need to understand exactly what's going on in their minds. How are they making decisions? What's different? And then third, help consumers choose where and how to economize. We'll hear later today from Premier Foods. One of their brands is Sharwoods. I saw a great piece that they published at the end of last week. They were saying they believe two things. One, that customers will never switch from Sharwoods premium sources and cooking aids to own brand products. And they wanted to make it very clear why Sharwoods is a premium product and exactly why you should stick with them and not switch to an own brand supermarket, own brand product. They also, too, seem to have started a campaign where they're saying, we don't make that own brand product. Here is your stark choice. You can buy a thing that is better and more expensive, or you can buy a thing that is worse and cheaper. Help consumers choose for your brand how to make that choice, because consumers are, as we saw all over the place, trying to make different choices about exactly where they deploy their expendable income, where they deploy, where they're cutting back. 
And to put your brand in the right position as those consumer choices arrive, that's the key. And that's why it's important to understand consumers. And I wanted to finish with just a little anecdote about the power of research. And I'm going to talk about Doritos. Uh, Doritos, for me personally, uh, my whole family's American. I got to know about Doritos uh, almost 40 years ago when I was a kid in summer in America. And Doritos had this very strange labeling. Uh, in America, Doritos, the two main flavors are called Cool Ranch and Nacho Cheese. Very unfamiliar to us in the UK, where they're called Cool Original and Tangy Cheese. Um, What's interesting is Doritos looked at the UK market and they ran some basic bottom-up research and they discovered the UK market back then when they launched Doritos in the UK about 20 years ago was the only market in the world where there wasn't a fried corn snack that was very popular. No tortilla chips, no fritos. They looked at the market and we had loads of amazing crisps. We had loads of amazing space invaders. We had these iconic brands, but there was nothing in the fried corn subcategory in the UK. And to big FMCG companies, they look at that and they're like, wow, we should put something there. We should put something there. And they had the perfect brand to put there and it was Doritos and it's from America. And then they brought over some packets and they discovered this strange thing. They discovered that the people in their office, I think it was in Swansea, the packets would mysteriously disappear at night. They bring over these packets of Doritos from America called Cool Ranch and Nacho Cheese and people would take them home and eat them. They were stealing them from the company. PepsiCo, they're desperately angry, but it showed them something. It showed them that people actually want this product. People wanted this fried corn snack. And they were like, OK, there's something going on here. People want this thing. There's a gap in the market. What are we going to do with it? And then they started testing with consumers the actual packaging. And what they found is that people in the UK, cool ranch, what is ranch? We don't know what ranch is. To Americans, it's the number one salad dressing. It's basically mayonnaise with some herbs in it. But we don't know what ranch is. Everyone they research with, we don't know what ranch is. Nacho cheese sounds a bit too exotic. Sounds a bit too spicy. <laughs> nachos? I don't like nachos. It sounds spicy, sounds scary. And so they ran the research. They also found that British people love the crisps to be crunchy. So they needed to make them thinner. They needed to have the same weight in the bag, more pieces of tortilla, but they needed to be thinner to make them more crunchy and more like English crisps. So they discovered by doing great research, you need to change the names. Not a complete pivot, but you need to make it more palatable, more accessible to the English palate. That's how they came up with Cool Ranch to Cool Original. And then from Nacho Cheese to Tangy Cheese. And by doing that, they were able to take those iconic brands from the US, launch them in the UK, evolve them, and localize them with an S, not a Z, for the UK market, and then figure out exactly how to make that stick. This is the power of great research. And then they turned that Dorito story into a repeatable engine. We now have salmon skin flavored Doritos that are available in Japan only at Christmas. There's Dukkha flavored Doritos available in North Africa all year round. But they've taken that engine of understanding the power of what consumers actually want, and they've used that to take the Doritos iconic brand, fill in the gap in the market, in every single market in the world, but with a completely localized version. And that's where research really comes to life. So today, we just wanted to put some numbers behind all of the panic that we're reading outside the doors today, and to try to bring it to life with some quantification about what that really means and some decisions for each of us. But as I mentioned at the beginning, Please do use today to learn from other brands, learn from each other, chat to each other, and take a couple things home, not to exactly copy what other brands are doing, but inspire yourself to figure out from what they're doing what you could do differently, and then use that to do something different tomorrow, and that's why we're here. So hugely excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I know that we talk a lot with you um, about the cost of sustainability and how much customers are willing to pay for sustainability. So for me, that was really interesting. It's quite difficult sometimes to get consumers to be honest about it. So of course, this kind of research is perfect for that.